<laughs> Good to know. Um, we are recording. We are recording this session, so you can uh, listen after the fact if you want to buy the cheese and listen to it all over again. So Cheese O'Clock is uh, a way of celebrating uh, this month the best in American cheeses, and our theme tonight is All in the Family. So all of the cheeses come from family-owned businesses, and our winery is family owned. You're in, in for an hour of uh, great cheese and wine with my co-host Laura Worlin and our guests Jeremy Little of Sweetgrass Dairy in Georgia and Emily Pickrell who's representing Stone Street Winery. I am the publisher of Planet Cheese, the author of a few books on cheese and a, these days a frequent uh, Zoom host about cheese. And with that I would like to turn it over to my co-host Laura Worlin. Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, indeed, I'm Laura Worland, and um, I'm a speaker on the subject of cheese. I'm a writer on the subject of cheese and all kinds of other things about cheese. But mostly I'm a co-host with Janet here for Cheese O'Clock, where we are uh, celebrating American Cheese Month, as we have said. And um, so I'm really happy that you all are here celebrating that with us. It is uh, something that happens every May, thankfully. And uh, it really, American cheese is something so worth celebrating, as you will discover with the four cheeses that we have today, but there are many, many, many more um, than these four. And so um, what I would like for you to do since, since May is coming to an end and therefore the official American Cheese Month, I would like you to take pictures of your cheese party. You can just like do a little selfie like this and get your little cheese board in there. And you can tag Janet uh, at Janet Fletcher NV is in Napa Valley, or me, Cheese Lady, C H E E Z E L A D Y, and um, and just let us know that you're having a good American cheese party too, uh, and um, yeah, let's just all have fun today. So Janet, I'll let you take it from here. Okie doke. Um, we have Emily Pickroll with us tonight. Emily's now a veteran of Cheese O'Clock. She's been on with us before, uh, but she's back tonight representing Stone Street uh, Wines. Emily's a master sommelier, and uh, she, which she has been since 2013. And at that time, she was only the 19th woman to become a master somme. So it's a very prestigious title, very hard to earn. And we are honored to have her uh, with us today. She's going to introduce us now to the two wines that we're going to be tasting tonight with the cheeses and telling us a little bit about Stone Street. Yeah, thank you, Janet. So I actually have the vineyard uh, behind me here so you can take a look at it. Stone Street Estate is a single mountain estate vineyard in the Alexander Valley. And as you can see from behind me, it's not actually in the valley at, Flo uh, valley at all. It is um, a mountain property. It's part of the Mayacamus mountain chain. So if you follow the Mayacamus range from Napa and uh, go through places like Mount Feeder and Diamond Mountain, that same mountain range naturally extends through Knights Valley and into the Alexander Valley, where at the northern end of the Alexander Valley, you find this beautiful mountain estate. So it's very apropos that we're tasting these wines tonight with the all in the family theme. Um, I work for Jackson Family Wines and they own about 50 different wineries around the globe. You might have uh, heard of wineries like Kindle Jackson or La Crema, but Stone Street is this beautiful estate property in the Alexander Valley that also happens to be the family's home. So um, it's, a, it's, it's very near and dear to their hearts and it's a really um, immense property. So the total mountain site is about 5,000 acres but only a fifth or so of that is planted. Less than a thousand acres are planted. And I think there's a picture of a map a couple slides ahead that I'll get to show you. But most of the, here it is, where you see color there in yellow and red, those are actual blocks, but everything else in this mountain is left um, natural. And the idea being that they didn't want to disrupt any of the natural wildlife corridors or, um, you know, overextend the natural resources that the mountain had to offer. So most of this is just natural habitat. And part of that, I think, is trans translated through these wines. So you'll see, because this is a mountain, we're dealing with elevation levels that range from about 400 feet at the base of the mountain all the way up to uh, about 2,400 feet in elevation. So uh, very high elevation, um, especially for Chardonnay. You'll see some Chardonnay blocks there planted at uh, elevations at 1,800 and 2,000 feet 
um, which is somewhat rare and unique for California. So we have an opportunity to taste a high elevation mountain Chardonnay in the glass. Um, this is a historical property. It was planted in uh, the 1970s and had a lot of acclaim. Jess Jackson and his wife purchased it in 1995 and fell in love with the property and decided, like I say, to um, make up their family home. So the family uh, still lives up here and now it's really in the helm of the second generation, um, Chris Jackson, who's Jess Jackson's son and his wife Ari Jackson are the current uh, proprietors of Stone Street Estate. And here they are pictured with their three young children. They actually have a fourth now since this uh, photo was taken, but um, they the future of Stone Street uh, Mountain Estate is currently under their tutelage and they're making a lot of um, personal investments into this property to ensure its longevity and place in the wine world. So that's just a little history about um, the property itself. The two wines that we're drinking uh, tonight in the glass are the Estate Chardonnay and the Estate Cabernet Sauvignon. So everything, like I say, comes from this beautiful high elevation mountain vineyard in the Maya Camus mountain chain in the northern end of the Alexander Valley. And it creates a very unique environment for growing high quality wine grapes. Um, not only do you deal with things like elevation, but you also have a lot of sunlight at these higher elevation vineyards, you're above the fog layer. Um, so you get really beautiful UV light, which is important for ripening Cabernet Sauvignon specifically. It really helps smooth out the tannins. So when you taste this Cabernet Sauvignon, you'll notice it's a very smooth um, soft example of Cabernet Sauvignon, which I personally think is great with cheese. So we'll have to see what you guys think as we taste through it. Um, but yeah, that's just a little bit about um, the wines in your glass, what, what you're tasting along with these cheeses. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to, I think, Jeremy to tell us about yeah. um, one of these cheeses. Well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna intervene. Nothing nothing personal, Jeremy. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we will get. We're saving the best for last. Um, I, actually, I'm, I'm gonna um, en encourage people to use the chat and make sure that the chat is um, is directed to panelists and attendees so that everybody can see everything. Unless you want to be specific to one of us or something like that. But otherwise, make sure that that's who your um, comment is directed to or your question. Uh, also, uh, speaking of Q&A and chats and all of that, please feel free to use it. We encourage that. We try to leave a little time at the end to get to them, and we also uh, try to monitor them throughout. We do have um, one of the cheesemakers, well, actually two of them, uh, who has made our third cheese. They, are, they have joined us, and so we do have cheesemakers in the chat in addition to our cheesemaker guest. There are some people behind his scenes that are there to answer questions too. So uh, about those cheeses. So please, um, please do use that. And um, so I guess with that, I think um, maybe we need to taste. I don't know, Janet. What do you think? I I'm hungry. <laughs> I am hungry. So let's um, dive into our first cheese. And it's kind of an unusual night tonight because we are. We don't have anything soft or anything really young. We we have all aged cheese tonight. So, um, powerful stuff. We're going to uh, dive right into a sheep cheese from Wisconsin called Marisa, named after the cheesemaker's daughter, and it is from a creamery called Car Valley. And this is the cave aged Marisa. He also makes um, just plain old Marisa, but the cave aged one has a natural wind on it, which means it was aged with exposure to air. So we've got this rind developed on it. And um, it's about a 10 pound wheel, aged about three months. Car Valley, as I said, is the creamery. The gentleman who makes it is a man named Sid Cook, who's just renowned um, for, for one thing, he's a fourth generation cheesemaker in Wisconsin. The Car Valley has been around for, well, the Cook family has been making cheese since eight, the 1880s. Car Valley has been there for since early 1900s. So there's a lot of history in this cheese, and Sid is a master cheesemaker, kind of like a master sommelier. It's a very, uh, it's something that Wisconsin does. Other states do not have master cheesemaker programs, but Wisconsin does to try to keep the standards up for the cheesemaking. It's a very rigorous credential, and Sid has it. So we know we have a cheese made by an expert cheesemaker. Um, so let's give this a taste. It feels very, it feels, you know, pretty moist to me, um, mm. moister than I'm used to with this cheese and a um, very even color. Um, this is a pressed cheese and so it's nice and compact. 
And I think you're going to find, if you think about this compared to something like a, a, a Tuscan Pecorino or even a French sheep cheese, like an Ossuerati or a Petit Basque, it's going to be very creamy, this cheese. very. Uh, it's going to be more mellow and very creamy. I think I'm going to use my cheese plain because it just looks to me like it's going to plain very nicely. Oh, that's interesting. I wondered if I wondered if it was almost too soft for a plane, but it no, worked. Not. Might... And the other the other thing I did, Laura, sorry to interrupt, but when I took this out of the plastic, I, I took a knife. I could see it was kind of I could just see the marks of the plastic on it. So I took just the table knife really, used the dull side, and I just scraped it until that glistening layer from the plastic, until I couldn't see it that glistening layer anymore. And that kind of wakes up the cheese and it, it, it releases any oxidized layer. So be sure you do that when you have a cheese that's been in plastic for a while. So let's taste this and see um, what we think. There are so few che sheep cheeses in this country. I really applaud Sid for making it. He buys the milk, it's Wisconsin milk. Um, I'm pretty sure I know where it comes from there aren't that many sheep cheese dairy creameries and uh, sheep cheese producers. I mean, sheep yeah. milk producers. Yeah. Right. Well, it, may, it may be the uh, Wisconsin sheep dairy co-op, I think. I didn't think that existed anymore. Is that? Oh, well, I've got it. I don't know. Eventually he did, but I thought that went out of business. So well, yeah, anyway. Well, um, maybe. Mm. So somebody in, um, commented on how the, the rind on this cheese tastes a little bit moldy. And, um, and there is mold on the rind by definition. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's not. And actually when we get to our next cheese with Jeremy, I think we, we can talk about the rind there, Jeremy, with, you, with your cheese, um, very different rind, of course. And I think that, um, and so what I would suggest is that if you don't like that flavor, whether or not this rind is meant to be eaten in the first place is probably a very, it is actually a very subjective thing. But if you feel like it just kind of tastes like mold, I would suggest you don't eat it and just concentrate on the paste, which is the inside of the cheese, uh, because the mold might uh, affect your impression of the overall cheese in a negative way. And we don't want that to happen. Yeah, I def I personally would not eat this rind. It's not going to hurt you. It's, it's harmless mold and what was in the air in their cave, but it is... it's just not going to be tasty. It's going to be strong and moldy. So let's just eat the inside. And I'd love to know um, what you're thinking. You can put it in the chat. It's, um, it's you know, some if you've had like Tuscan Pecorinos or Spanish sheep cheeses, they often can have kind of a, a lanolin sort of scent, like wet wool or a, a mutton chop. This has none of that. It's very sweet. Um, there's like a sweet finish to it. Um, Jeremy, do you want to weigh in on, on this? Sure. Um... <clears throat> I think it's a, a beautiful cheese. I think that um, uh, initially, when I when I smell when I smell the rind, you can you can smell the aging conditions. Um, I think that it really speaks to the quality of the milk that Sid is getting, which I think this the quality of the sheep's milk is is got to be really 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 fresh and really really great. Um, it's very well balanced to me. I love the texture. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, just maybe a kind of a nerdy fact nugget out there, but as far as the natural rind goes, um, I can tell that the aging environment, I, I would love to know from Sid himself, but I can tell that the aging environment is definitely a higher humidity environment because like Janet, you were, you were referring to some pe pecorinos and such that are maybe a little drier texturally, whereas this has a great elasticity to it. It's definitely got great mouthfeel. Um, so I think that the... Um, the the aging conditions that they're they're aging this cheese in um, are probably very more more of a higher humidity environment and that is probably lending itself to some of the kind of that cave like wet cement slate sort of aromas that you guys are are picking up off the rind but to that point um, the ability to grow microorganisms on the rind is also very uh, um, very intimately influenced by the amount of oxygen exchange that's allowed in the environment. So um, this is something that's very new to us. We've got a new cheese making facility, but in my opinion, um, whatever Sid is doing in his environment is actually speaking more to um, 
an aging environment that you would use for like a, uh, a wash drying cheese. So something that's going after more uh, yeast and bacteria and less fungi. Uh, and, and then I'll stop. I'll stop the nerdy side. I'm <laughs> Emily, what do you think about the wines? Did you have a impression, a favorite? Yeah, so I saw in the comment that um, somebody mentioned they think that both wines pair with the cheese. I agree with that. And so I kept going back and forth and taking little bites of cheese and having little sips. And just my my last and final impression was with the Chardonnay specifically. So there's a lot of Lees contact on the Chardonnay. Lees is um, a natural byproduct of the winemaking process. It's the yeast cells that after they're done fermenting uh, sugar and alcohol, they naturally kind of die off and precipitate in, into wine. And a winemaker has a choice of whether or not to age a wine on its lees. And in this, in the example of the Chardonnay, there's quite a bit of not just lees aging, but the mm -hmm. winemaker intentionally um, does what's called stirring the lees to really incorporate that texture and flavor into the Chardonnay. Um, and I think that they're just, the, the flavors of the cheese really highlight the lees characteristics of this wine and it makes the wine have an incredibly long finish when you try it with the cheese. Yeah, it's a very creamy wine and the cheese is creamy as well. So there's that kind of textural echo. Yeah. Yeah. I like the I like them both too though, I have to say. But I definitely uh, preferred the Chardonnay also. Uh, I thought that the it brought something out in the cab that I hadn't gotten uh at the beginning, which is kind of a more um uh sort of savory, savage, kind of rustic characteristic as opposed to the fruit, the berry kind of thing. That really was accentuated for me, the, those savory characteristics with that cheese. Um, and also I wanted to say one other thing about the cheese. I noticed, um, because I opened it a couple days ago, uh, I noticed, or maybe even longer ago than that, that it was quite moist. And so what I did was I immediately put it in parchment paper because I actually thought it, I didn't want it to stay so moist. I thought it might, be killing the rind, and so I just put it in parchment paper, and um, and then I just slipped it right back into that that plastic sleeve that it came in. But by then it was open, so it could breathe, but yet still be a little bit protected. I mean, I could have put it just into a Ziploc also, and um, and put it back in the fridge just to allow it to develop. And I have to say that it's um, I think that actually helped improve it a little. Not that it was because sometimes plastic is just not a cheese's friend. And so most of the time, actually. Um, so a cheese needs to um, be let out and breathe also. So it's just for future reference. Most cheeses, if not all, you might want to do that with when you get them, if you're not going to eat them right away, if they've come vacuum sealed like that. Vacuum sealing is OK up to a certain point. But certain kinds of cheeses don't do so well with that. And they will eventually kill the rind. So I'm glad that I let this out of its plastic jail a little bit earlier. <laughs> Um, okay, shall we move on? I think it's time. Okay. Uh, all right, by the way, I forgot to mention that all of the cheese collections from Cheese O'Clock are still available. So this is our fourth week, as Janet mentioned, and so there are three other collections available. All of the Zoom recordings are available except for week one, which was called Holy Cow. That Zoom recording um, does not exist, but the rest of them do or will after tonight. So uh, just wanted you to know that. Just have to go to iGourmet and type in Cheese O'Clock and you'll get all of the collections. All right. So Jeremy uh, Little is, um, Jeremy, I don't know how long ago I met you, but it was pretty early on in my cheese career and therefore in yours too. A uh, little later, a little earlier in yours than in mine. And um, so Jeremy went to uh, Florida State University and studied uh, psychology and then minored in English and Spanish. And the goal was to become, was to get into the culinary field. So. Okay, I don't really, psychology, English, Spanish, but to be a culinarian or a chef. Uh, but it all worked out in a way because then you went into, I think, restaurant management at Atlanta where you met J uh, Jessica, your other half. And uh, Jessica, I know, comes from a dairy family and you all went down to from Atlanta to Thomasville. You fell in love with cheese making and the rest, as they say, is history. Sweetgrass Dairy was already born, but you you brought it to to what it what it is today. Um, Jeremy, you are also the father of four boys, 
God bless you, and uh, and Jessica too, and uh, involved with the Southern Foodways Alliance and also is a member of the Guild de Fromager, which is a very nice honor. Mm. And uh, so welcome, Jeremy. Thank you so much for coming here from Thomasville, which I think is right on the border of Florida. Am I right? That's correct. We're about 25 miles from the, from the border of Florida. Yeah. So maybe um, maybe before we get into the cheese and, and into more about sweetgrass dairy, we take a look at the video that's going to give us a literal lay of the land here. So Dana, roll the, roll the tape if you can. Well, Jackson family works too, but <laughs> hopefully we can see the little family. Well, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, I just to actually have, well, I, because that Jackson family photo made me think of it. Emily, where does the name Stone Street come from? So Stone Street is uh, Jess Jackson's middle name, and it was passed down to his son, who's Christopher Stone Street, Street Jackson. And I believe Jess's father's middle name was also Stone Street. So it's just a family name that's been passed down for quite a few generations now. Got it. Okay. Glad I asked. All right, here we go. We think. <laughs> it's all about the connection. <laughs> all right. Hip plug. Hello, folks. Welcome to Zoom Land. <laughs> Quality does not have to mean exclusive. People just get disconnected and they're like, we can't use Thomas Will Tome on a grilled cheese. And it's like, well, why not? Maybe it's the best grilled cheese you've ever had in your life. I grew up on a dairy farm. When the South, you eat from the garden out of necessity, not because it was cool. Fell in love with sustainable agriculture and humane animal husbandry. We really felt like we have this platform because we are able to graze cattle year round and we can grow grass most of the year, almost almost 365 days. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Treat the soil the way that makes the most sense to grow great grass and you feed it to animals that have great genetics and you do as little as possible and you have this great finished product. You know, could we play with more culture and could we, you know, try to do this and do that? We don't need to. The milk speaks for itself. We really need to represent the South as well. We want sweetgrass dairy to be the first creamery that comes to mind. When they think who's using their sense of place in a way that shines through in their cheeses. So, Jeremy, I think everybody's going to want to move to Thomasville after seeing that video. It looks so bucolic. <laughs> Uh, you must you must have happy cows, but we all know that it's kind of hot and humid down there too. So, so what's the, what are the conditions like for that for the cows? Are they out on grass a whole lot of the time, and how does that affect your cheese making? So we actually are very fortunate that even though um, indeed it is hot, it was ninety six degrees for today. Um, the cows actually follow uh, the irrigation system around, and they are we are able to keep them on grass. 100% of the time year round, which is very uh, unique, uh, but it's also hugely beneficial for us. So interestingly enough, the, you know, the milk does, the milk does change, but primarily it is fat content. And um, that is due primarily to the, the state, whatever stage of lactation the cows are in. But the other benefit that we have, which we're very, very fortunate to have this is that, um, you know, speaking towards all in the family, um, you know, all of our milk comes from Jessica's mother and father and or a brother. So they have multiple farms and each one of the farms is in a different uh, lactation cycle. So uh, we are pretty much able to get the best milk of whatever's available at that time. So seasonality is not a challenge for us. And so do you have, are they all the same breed of cow? No, my, my mother-in-law is quite the geneticist. Uh, they believe in, um, really being as diverse as possible. So just like, you know, have, if you've, anybody that loves a, an Alpine or, or a, a mountain style cheese, you know, different uh, bacteria thrive at higher elevations for, for various reasons. And uh, that actually makes for a more complex finished product. And so for us, the cows are able to get a very interesting diversity of, of local grasses for seasonality. 
And then consequently, the cows are also quite a, uh, a mixed lot of different breeds. It's actually pretty interesting. I don't know much about it necessarily, but um, it's fun to listen to my mother-in-law talk about it. <laughs> well, um, obviously the cheese kind of speaks for itself too. So tell us what we have here today. What is Thomasville Tome? The Thomasville Tome is our homage to Thomasville. Um, Thomasville is a, a tiny little town in Southwest Georgia. Um, and uh, as far as style wise, uh, Tome is a, in European traditions, you know, it's, there's Tome all across, you know, Italy, France, Spain, uh, that everybody's had, I'm sure. Um, but a Tome in France is basically a uh, sort of a, whatever the cheesemaker's style of choice was. And so typically um, milk that would, that would, from the dairy farmer, you know, the, the cream would go to someone to make butter. And then a lot of times the, the sort of leftover, if you will, milk uh, went into a whatever style tome they had just so that it wouldn't go to waste. Uh, and so for us, this is kind of our homage to, to just being proud of being in Thomasville and in our location. But then also this is, for me, this is uh, probably my favorite cheese to eat because of the fact that it's so versatile. I mean, it, you can eat it as a table cheese by itself and it's great when it's young, you can cook with it. We use it in our pimento cheese. Um, it's really just a, a very simple cheese to make. Uh, but I think that it really speaks to the, the quality of, of the milk that we have and just trying to keep things simple. I have to say, that's a very special pimento cheese. First of all, I've had it and I love it. But second of all, that you use this cheese to make it is really something. All right, so let's, um, let's taste it and tell us. Um, I mean, this rind is quite beautiful. And I know that doesn't just happen. It's, um, it's just, it, all, it smells so good too. God, I just kind of want to go into your aging room and just lay down. <laughs> it just really does. It's a beautiful cheese. So how do you, how do you, how does that happen? So, I mean, not, not getting too geeky about this, by the way. Okay, I hear you, I understood, yes ma'am. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the rhymes that we have on here is natural. So basically uh, because of the fact that this, this particular cheese was produced in our, our previous, our original facility, I should say, the one that my mother-in-law and father-in-law built 20 years ago. Um, but because of the age of the aging environments, um, the, the different cheeses that we've made and just the different bacteria that have sort of gotten uh, comfortable in those environments um, end up propagating the rinds. And so it has to do with the moisture content of uh, the cheese itself, uh, specifically salt, uh, a lot of salt concentration. So if you, if you look at the, at the rind kind of up close, you'll notice that it's not very uniform as far as the coloration and the different patterns that you get. And that's specifically because this cheese is salted uh, by hand. We have uh, Atlantic sea salt that is applied to the exterior over a three day period. Um, and so you consequently, the different concentrations of salt either promote or inhibit different organisms to grow at different times. And so we have a, we have a, a gentleman named Patrick uh, who is in our aging rooms that is responsible for manicuring these. And so just about every, every two weeks or so, he'll flip them over and take a, a damp towel that has a saltwater solution with um, uh, an organism called the Baromyces in it, which helps promote uh, other organisms to grow on the grind. And so he just kind of spreads the, the, the starting bacteria growing around it uh, to try to keep it even. And then once it gets kind of a, an initial start, uh, it pretty much takes care of it. And so um, this has been aged how many months? Four months. Okay. Well, it's only a month older than the, uh, Marisa, cave age Marisa, but it's quite a bit firmer and drier and more sort of brittle. Um, is that because of the, the conditions in the aging room primarily, or do you do more pressing or? So Janet, this is, this is a uh, gravity press cheese. So that's not, it's definitely not pressed. But what I will say, and I don't, I've never been to any of, of Sid's um, production facilities, but in our original facility, we don't really have a lot of control in our aging rooms over specific humidity. And we have temperature control, of course, but humidity and oxygen exchange are not something that we really have a lot of control over. So consequently, uh, our aging environments are a little less stable than would be ideal for, for, a cheese maker in particular. So this cheese will actually lose a little bit more moisture over time than what I would venture to say that the Marisa is aged in. It's really, it's such a beautiful cheese. I mean, you worked on this for a while, you've had it for a while, but I feel like it's something that has evolved even in its own self. 
Sure. Yeah. Since I first had it. I, I um, you know, I, I, I went, I, I've, how do I say this? I've been making cheese for 20 years and I've probably only felt confident as a cheesemaker in the last five. And part of that is because, you know, Laura and Janet, I think that you guys can speak to this, but, you know, when all of us started, you know, kind of getting into the cheese world, there wasn't a ton of like uh, documented cheese making resources where you could go and have follow this seminar and read about this and so on and so forth. It was kind of like you had to learn as you go, which for me, I, I love that sort of thing. But when you get to the max and you don't know how to get over that hump to learn more, it can be particularly frustrating. And so about, I think it was 2017, 2016, 2017, um, Jessica, of course, my wife, uh, sent me an email uh, that Jasper Hill was hosting um, a cheese making 101 course uh, in Vermont. And so I said, sure, I'll go. And so I was in Vermont for two weeks and uh, I learned from um, a French guy. Um, and also I got to hang out with Mateo and Andy and just getting grossed in all of the beautiful things that are in Vermont. And um, it really gave me a tool set that I never had before. And it was written in a way that I could, I could utilize. Like it was basically like a brand new set of tools. And so I immediately, <laughs> funny enough, I, uh, I, I sort of, I got a little, a little excessive. I was texting our cheese team from the classroom. And I was like, you guys need to do this and do that and do that. And, and it was terrible. That was a terrible idea. So um, <laughs> I waited until I got back and, you know, we went from, from having, you know, a diversity of, of different starter cultures of like two or three to almost 12. So uh, we, we, we really, I really learned about the different organisms and kind of how you can use them in conjunction. And Thomas Tome was the first one that I was really able to kind of showcase that. So thank you for noticing that. I appreciate that. Well, it's <laughs> super nutty. That's the thing I get most is this in the aroma is nuttiness. And I, I just thought it was beautiful with the Chardonnay. Emily, did you have an opinion? Yes, I sorry, I was pulling up the chat again um, to make sure I got the name right. So Martin sent a message, red or white with the cheese disagreement in our house. I so for me, this this cheese, because it comes from grass fed cow milk has that slight herbal grassiness to it, which I think makes it very complex and beautiful. And I like that with the red wine. Um, Laura mentioned on the last cheese that the red she thought had less of the fruitiness she was expecting and more of the secondary aromas. And I pointed out earlier when I was talking about this mountain, how much of it is left to natural flora and fauna because all of those natural elements present on the mountain from the, the bay and the laurel trees and just the mountain scrub, that those all have influence over the characteristics of the grapes that grow here. And I think that really shows through in the Cabernet Sauvignon. And I, I liked that um, kind of savage, um, more like I say, secondary um, flavor component with the, the grass fed nature of this particular cheese. So I'm curious what our cheesemaker thinks, Jeremy, with your with your cheese. Do you have a preference for for the wine? One of the wines? Let me let me try it with the Cabernet. I tried it with the uh, Chardonnay. Let me try it with the Cabernet. Okay. I won't ask you a question while you're tasting. No pressure, Jeremy. We're not putting you on the spot or anything. <laughs> you can say both. I think I actually prefer the Cabernet as well, um, but for different reasons. I think that the the Chardonnay brings out more of the the sort of creamy buttery characteristics of the milk whereas the cabernet speaks a little bit a, a little more uh vegetal to me and i i think the vegetal is 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 my preference it's a yeah. very versatile cheese that way i can pick a lots of different wines that it would it would go with including you know sherry and mm -hmm. tawny port and <laughs> sherry would be good it's, yeah. just, um, it's just a it's such a balanced cheese i think it can go in a lot of different directions wine wise yeah, I think we should move on to our third cheese. Yeah, and the um, cheese mess and the cheesemakers are on the call. Uh, um, Leslie and Matthew, that's Leslie Jacobs and Matthew Bridgeford. This is the cheese they have supplied for us. Is their Everton? So this is Jacobs and Bridgeford Everton. If I misspeak, misrepresent it, I know they will correct me. So, and if you have specific questions about the cheese, they can answer it. Um, 
they are in Indiana and they have, um, they are on um, Matthew's family farm and it has been a farm for 200 years. <laughs> and uh, Matthew has only been making cheese there for, uh, now I'm forgetting, I think about 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Um, and, you know, he came back to the family farm to make cheese and, and keep the farm, you know, add some value to the milk from their farm. But they are, uh, they make several different types of cheese. This is um, farmstead, meaning they have their own animals. It's raw milk, grass-fed animals. So that is pretty cool. Well, you, you can't say that about too many American cheeses anymore, that they are all of those things. So I'm glad that we um, have it. They have something like, they have about 1,300 acres, a couple of hundred cows, and um, they have you know, a daughter who helps them with it. So this is modeled after, the, after Alpine cheeses of France and Switzerland, cheeses like, that you know, like Gruyere and Conte, Appenzeller. It's a similar style. Look at the color. If you have it, or if you, I mean, my computer screen doesn't do it justice. Laura, look at Laura's. It is just mm -hmm. deep butter yellow, and that is from the grass-fed milk. It comes from the carotene that's in the grass, and that persists in the milk and persists in the cheese. This is a pressed cheese, unlike um, Jeremy's. Um, it is a cooked cheese, so it gets very firm and compact, and it's capable of aging a long time because it doesn't have a lot of whey still in it. So it's this is actually probably, it's at least eight months old. Uh, I think they take this up to 12, and then they start to call it reserve. This is not the reserve. So <clears throat> natural wine, um, and let's, let's take a taste. I'm loving it, I have to already say, with the, <clears throat> with the Chardonnay. Haven't even tried it with the cabbage, but it's a beautiful cheese. It is um, beautiful looking, as you pointed out. It's it really does it really does feel like old and new world bridged. I mean, I can't I can't speak to the terroir of Indiana, but um, but it really does have its own um, kind of unique characteristics. But I also feel like I'm in the mountains of. France or Switzerland or wherever it might be. There is that, um, not so much the onion flavor, but a little bit for me. I'm not getting it as pronounced as I do in other cheeses, but one that I might expect. And God, I just wanna just keep eating that cheese. It's as equal, equally, equally, I should say at home, I think as a table cheese, as it would be as a melting cheese, which those cheeses are often used for, whether it's fondue or or like we saw the grilled cheese in the in your video, Jeremy. <laughs> it's um, I mean, and also I just wanted to point out I get a tiny, tiny little bit of tingling on my tongue in the back of my tongue, which um, these kinds of cheeses can have. Mm -hmm. I imagine if this cheese were the reserve, I would get that even more, which is kind of a which is a histamine that. And so I am just pointing this out uh, in case anybody is sort of feeling that same thing. Uh, it's just, it's not uncommon at all. But I, and I don't know if anyone else is getting it here on the panel, but I'm getting a little I am, bit of that. I mean, You and I have talked about this before. I'm really sensitive to it. It makes my tongue burn a little bit and I have to kind of power through it because I really love the aroma and the flavor of the cheese, but there is this slight burn. I, I like the burn. It reminds me of horseradish. Like it's <laughs> when you eat sushi and you have that wasabi burn afterward that... Yeah. Like, kind of, it yeah. hurts, but I want to do it again. It <laughs> I get that so with good. cheese. Yeah. <laughs> it like, burns a little, but I want to keep eating it. <laughs> so it's a little drier, maybe more sandy than a, a Gruyere or a Comte would be. And um, maybe Matthew can comment in the chat on that. I don't know if it has to do with cooking temperatures or dryness in the aging room. Um, but it's, you know, it's another cheese that really shaves very well. And... Um, just has more of a, I do get a little, it has those deep roasted nut aromas and just more meatiness, I would say, than the Thomas Tunnel, more of a beefy, meaty aroma. It's definitely a roasted meat kind of thing. Yeah. So I said I definitely liked it with the Chardonnay. I just changed my mind. I like it with the Cabernet. Emily, what do you think? Same. I went back and forth after you said the Chard you like the Chardonnay more and I'm, I'm sticking with the Cab. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Matthew says it's probably age-related, this dryness or more. It's not dry, it's just, you know, a little more sandy, I guess, is the word I come up with uh, in yeah. the texture. 
it's just, it's almost like a little bit more compressed maybe than, or, or something, or the, the, the perception of it is that as compared with um, perhaps a Fonte. So um, Jeremy, what do you think of this cheese um, in terms of it's just its technicality and, and do you like it? <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I love it. It's delicious, number one. It's beautiful. The milk has got to be, I mean, there's got, I don't know what the fat content is, but for raw milk, it's it's got to be high. I mean, it's so yellow. The rind is so thin and so delicate. You can tell somebody really cared about this cheese while it was aging, especially for such a long time. Um, I want like a big bowl of roasted potatoes and like some mustard. Yeah. <laughs> Melt this all over the top of it because and I- And a beer? I was gonna say maybe a beer. <laughs> eat it without the beer. Like this cheese, no, this cheese is kudos. This cheese is is fantastic. I am, I am very impressed and I'm honestly a little bit jealous. They yeah. have a lot of the um, breeds, the cow breeds that they have in the Alps, the okay. Normand yeah. and the Montbeyard mm -hmm. and that, you know, these fancy European breeds that we don't have very much of here in the U.S., but they do have them on um, on the Jacobs and Bridgeford farm. I don't think it, I think that has another farm name, but they, they, um, they do have these uh, breeds that are essential to making this style of cheese. In fact, in Europe, if you want to make... Uh, say a Comte or a Gruyere, the breeds are specified. You can't just use any type of cow. You have to use, in some cases, just one or two different breeds of cow. So there's something special about the milk from those breeds that produces uh, very good examples of this type of Alpine cheese. And, you know, I find it interesting that in that part of France and Switzerland, the white wine that they make is very thin and tart because it's cold there. And I don't think it goes so great with the cheese. This I find that this Chardonnay, which has more texture, more weight, is a much better match for this kind of Alpine cheese than the little thin little wines from Eastern France. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I agree with you, Janet. And I I found um, also in Eastern France that so they do make those that wine that's got oxidation basically the van jaune the yellow one so that has some more of the texture so I'm, I'm with you on that all right so i think we should maybe move on to our to our last cheese so this cheese is i i i i, I hesitate to use the word unique but it is very it is in a rare category which is basically a cheddar meat meets blue this is not shropshire which is a whole different thing if you've heard of that cheese from england but so what the cheesemaker, his name is Chris Raleigh, and he has a company called Raleigh Cheese House. He is, uh, I don't actually know if he's third or fourth generation, but he's probably the last in his family to make cheese. Um, he was telling me that his daughter and son have different ideas for their futures than the cheese operation, though his son is working with him currently. But in any case, uh, what makes this cheese unusual is because you, it's very hard to combine cheddar and blue, and that's because Cheddar cheese, aged cheddar as this one is, is um, they, the, the, we were talking before about pressed cheeses. The, the whole idea is to get as much air out of the, the center of the cheese and really compact the curds and set it up for aging, which in this case is only about three months. But, um, and then the curds are very small. There just isn't, uh, there, there isn't meant to be much whey or liquid in the, in the cheese. And so the way that a blue mold proliferates is with oxygen. And so if there's no oxygen, well, gee, how does the blue mold get there? Well, there are two ways. One is the oxygen, if there's just a little space in between the curds. So indeed, if you find little, little places where there's blue, that's where there was oxygen between the curds. And then otherwise, you see this line. And so he adds blue, mold, Roqueforti, Penicillium Roqueforti, to the milk at the very beginning of cheese making. He adds them with other cultures. So he uses cheddar cultures, which is how you get the cheddar flavors, and then the blue. So then after he's formed the cheese, he then pierces it with metal skewers. What this is doing is it, it's introducing oxygen from the outside of the cheese on into the inside. So he's essentially creating a, a needle type hole to, to uh, get the blue to, to develop. And it's not a blue tasting cheese. It doesn't really taste like a blue cheese, though you definitely get that flavor. Uh, it really is more dominant, dominated by the cheddar 
the traditional cheddar-ness of this cheese. But the blue um, really gives it a whole other thing. And as I said, I mean, it's a lot of, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of work to make a cheese like this. He also makes another cheese that's apparently flying off the shelves. It's called Red Rock. It is called Red Rock because he adds a whole lot of annatto, which is the, the natural seed dye that, that makes cheese orange, but it's really orange, it's orange red. And he does the same thing with, with the blue mold. It's a delicious cheese. It's in a, in a rectangular form and they're both just amazing cheeses. And so, um, so that's what this is. And by the way, he's in a place called Schulzburg, Wisconsin. And uh, <clears throat> I've been there on the day that he makes fresh curds and the lines are all the way to Madison, which is no short distance, trust me. The people just wait in line for his cheese curds. And I have to say, I've had a lot of cheese curds. I don't think I've had any better than his. So I understand why they wait in, in line for those. Uh, and he said uh, that during the, during the pandemic that um, there was still a lot of call for his cheese curds, so. Yeah, right. I, I hope I, excuse me if I'm repeating you, Laura, I was paying attention to the chat and not listening that carefully, but you know, Chris Raleigh has a, um, his family's history is really interesting because uh, they were, in, his dad was in the cheese business and they made just commodity cheese, just, you know, Wisconsin cheddar. It didn't have a brand on it. It was sold on price, not on quality. And they were going broke with every pound they sold. In fact, at one point, Chris told me we made a penny a pound. And, you know, it just wasn't sustainable. So they shuttered the creamery. And it took Chris many years to talk his dad into reopening and moving in an artisan direction, which is what they did. They had to rescale. They had to get like small equipment instead of big equipment. And Chris had to come up with these unique recipes and, you know, a brand and marketing them because it's no longer Wisconsin cheddar. It's a brand. And he is so creative and, um, you know, he, he's kind of surprised by his own success. He said, I had no idea this cheese would take off like it has, but it's it's just such a fascinating blend of that cheddar texture and cheddar foundation with the blue kind of woven right. in there. I, I just, I find it just, you just keep coming back because you're, it's riveting. Well, Jeremy, you must have some thoughts about it as a, as a cheese maker. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It's delicious. It's actually very interesting because I, I blue cheese is personally my favorite cheese to make. It's a real pain. That's like the diva of the cheese world with all of the specificity as far as moisture and salt and things of that nature. But um, cheddar and blue specifically, like with cheddaring, you are sort of racing acidity and, and lowering the pH very, very quickly. And so consequently, you salt the cheese or the curds before you put them into the mold and press. And blue cheese is not necessarily a big fan of, of unbalanced or excessive salt. So like, I don't know, it's an interesting, I, I think it's really cool. I mean, I've, I've not had it a bunch, but it's fun to look at. It's got a super funky rind on the outside and texturally, texturally it's, it's super fun. Like it's, it's, it's very um, pudgy, I think is the word uh, that I would use. It's, it's, um, it's super fun. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know how I would try to tackle making that. So kudos to her. It's pretty damp, or I don't know about yeah. your piece, but my piece is, is um, weeping yeah. a bit. It's pretty moist. It's more moist than I'm accustomed to for a cheddar. And I don't know if that's intentional. Um, I think it had to do, again, I think, you know, what I was saying before about taking the Marissa out of the packaging, I think um, this needed to come out of the plastic a little sooner. I, I, I think that's what some of it. Um, uh, because I agree with you, it's not, I haven't had uh, this particular cheese, the Dunbarton Blue, ever this moist. So I think it's about how it was packaged, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it's sort of the necessary evil of the moment when we're all buying, a lot of us are still buying cheese online. And, you know, it has to come to you sometimes from far away. It has to go from the creamery to the, you know, the online merchant's warehouse. And then it has to go from them to you. And uh, it can sometimes get beat up by a temperature fluctuations, although everybody does everything to make that not happen. But uh, it's not like going to your neighborhood cheese shop. And I, you know, as much as I'm grateful to Igor May for making 
cheese o'clock possible and uh, our cheese enjoyment possible over the last year plus. Um, we have our independent shops also that we need to patronize. And now that they're coming back, you know, yeah. um, and we feel better about going into them and shopping, I hope we will all we'll go back and patronize our cheese shops because we'll, you, you'll never get a better piece of cheese than the one that was freshly cut for you. <laughs> And, and speaking of that, I, I can just say, Jeremy, that I know that you have a retail store at uh, in Thomasville and a restaurant, little cafe, diner, restaurant thing, <laughs> and, uh, and, and you sell cheeses. But, I, but wait, we haven't gotten to the equally important part here. I want to talk about the wine. So um, I have my own opinion, but I'm going to hold it. So Emily, what do you think with this cheese? Typically with a blue cheese, I would go with a red. I just think that red wines stand up better to the assertiveness of the blue vein or even venture into fortified wines and go with like a vintage port. But um, with the nature of the cheddar, going back to that like lazy characteristic, which I often describe as having a cheesy flavor. And to me, cheddars are like the epitome of that cheesy flavor. I think that the white wine pairs better with this. What do you guys think? Well, I definitely like the white wine. Janet, I go ahead. No, I had a different experience. Um, usually with cheddar, I want a red wine. <clears throat> and um, that's where I went here. Even though usually with blue, I want a sweet wine. And I felt like at least this blue was subtle enough that the red wine was possible. I didn't, I felt like it kind of rolled over the, the white wine. So that to me didn't, didn't work as well. It really, so this cheese, I just want to point out, unlike regular blue cheeses, where even if you don't get a taste where, where the actual veining is, it's going to still taste like a blue cheese. Here, it really is kind of a mashup. It's not like the rest of the cheese tastes like a blue cheese. It, you get, you know, it's kind of, you really get more dominant cheddar flavors than you do blue flavors. And so I think it really depends what bite you have in terms of the pairing that you, the pairing sort of or compatibility that you get. So maybe some bites will be better with the white and some bites better with the red. So I say try both. <laughs> you know, this is I think a good place to point out that, uh, and you've probably seen this when you have gone to the store to buy a cheddar, often an English cheddar with the bandage on the outside, uh, you know, a cheesecloth wrap, you see blue in that cheddar. It's just, it's come in through the cracks and it wasn't intentional. Like with this cheese where it was intentional, a lot of English cheddars and sometimes American cheddars have a little bit of blue veining in them. And cheese mongers, the cheese merchants say that they have the hardest time selling those cheeses because people think they're flawed. They don't want a cheddar with any mold in it. Well, as you've seen, it can be quite delicious. So don't just, you know, knee jerk, refuse that cheddar with the blue veins. It can be a really interesting taste experience. Yeah. Jeremy, do you have any thoughts about this cheese? This cheese is awesome. Yeah. I um I actually like it with the with the cabernet personally. I think it's a it's a big flavor. I think it's a, the cheese is an umami bomb. So for me, the red wine really helps to kind of actually it helps it kind of balances it out. Even that's kind of crazy to say that a, a cabernet is going to help balance a cheese out but and that's that's my opinion it's awesome it's an awesome cheese i like it a lot well i always say that the bigger the wine the smaller the universe of cheeses that's going to go with it but if you're gonna but if you're going to pair a cheese with a wine like this this wine by the way i just want to point out both wines are just beautiful and they're so emblematic of their of of their type i mean of the cabernet of the chardonnay you know i don't know that particular mountain per se but I just think uh, the cabin, I mean, I love them both, but the cab in particular, it's just a really beautiful wine. And I mean, Stone Street doesn't have the reputation it does for nothing. It's, it's got a good reputation. And those of you who got the wine tonight, I'm sure you're loving it. Uh, I just, anyway, I think it's really special. And Emily, I just want to tell you that. And I want to tell everybody at Stone Street, I just how much I, and I know Janet and Jeremy too, appreciate this opportunity to taste these really incredible wines. And you. so what I love about the cab though, is that many, many California cabs, which to say California cabs is unfair because they're so different from region to region. But um, what we think of as a California cab can be so overwhelming with, with and, and for the most part, I will not pair them with cheese. However, when you have a wine like this one, 
and a cheese that, as Jeremy said, is an umami bomb like this, uh, I think it's a match made in heaven. I really do. And with the sugar. Well, you have a difference of opinion here <laughs> about Cabernet and cheese. But as you know, <laughs> you would, I'm going to speak up for Cabernet. But I, I'm not going to go down that path. I, before we close, I really would love to hear from both um, uh, Jeremy and Emily about as we're emerging out of this COVID crisis and getting a little closer to normal life. Jeremy, I, let's start with you. I really would love to hear what you think has changed permanently in the artisan cheese world. How is life going forward for your business going to be different? Wow. Um, or maybe, wow. Not. maybe you're going to get totally back to the way things were. You no, see your business picking I mean, back up? We are. So it's, we, we, <laughs> we, it took us five plus years to try to organize a new facility, whether it was the financing or the design or the construction. And we ended up starting in a pandemic. So we, this, this last Monday, so four days ago was the first day that our entire staff has now been in our new facility. Um, and um, I can tell you that from a sales perspective, our business is, is like, we're, we are trying to keep up with sales now. Uh, and we are, we are finally in a position where we are able to, we are able to push forward with confidence and with ambition. And I was actually telling some of our team today that I've, I have not been this inspired maybe in my whole life. So I'm very excited about what we are going to be able to produce in this new facility. Um, and I'm excited for the, I think. I think the whole world is so excited about not having to wear a mask and being able to go have dinner and do those sorts of things that I think that I, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I think that this has changed everybody's perspective about taking it, you know, taking things for granted. So I think people are going to appreciate experiences more now, now that they're able to have them from when they weren't able to have them. And I think that anybody that produces a, a, anything consumable, appreciates that. Anybody that's going to appreciate what they're consuming more is is never a bad thing. Emily, what's your experience? Um, so first and foremost, being able to host events like this um, and touch um, more consumers with a wide cast net in a virtual environment without having to get on a plane and go to each of your cities has been a big change that I think had to occur because of COVID. But going forward, I think there's going to be a mix of virtual opportunities combined with in-person opportunities. So I think that um, Zoom and Microsoft Teams and that kind of thing is just a new way of doing business. Um, for me, a lot of my, I, I'm in sales and a lot of my business is in the on-premise restaurant trade. So um, it's been, you know, kind of a roller coaster every year, but just seeing restaurants open back up and seeing patrons being out eating and drinking and like Jeremy said, enjoying the experience. I mean, that in my opinion is having been in the restaurant industry for years, what the restaurant industry is about. It's about, you know, providing a, a temporary environment, a little escape from your everyday life and offering you an experience to taste things that you wouldn't otherwise normally make for yourself at home. So I look forward to restaurants rebounding and having opportunities myself to go out and eat and drink and just see the joy on other people's faces as they do the same. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, and we need to wrap this up. I just, uh, before I turn it over to Laura to conclude it, I just want to thank everybody for coming and supporting this uh, adventure that Laura and I have had with Cheese O'Clock. It has been such a pleasure to do, to introduce you to some of our favorite cheeses and cheesemakers and wines and we hope uh, that you'll uh, keep on, you know, keep on exploring, keep on uh, trying different things that you haven't tried before because there's so many, cheese is a journey, as is wine, and uh, we'll hope you will enjoy that journey and, and keep on that path. Laura, you probably have some concluding remarks. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll echo what you said. And, you know, I mean, there's only been four cheeses each week, so 16 cheeses a month. But, um, but over the course of the year, that's, you know, it's added up to a lot more than that. And I just always go back to my amazement and my admiration for American cheesemakers like Jeremy and so many others who are just 
doing it day after day and producing these unbelievable cheeses. Chris Raleigh was telling me that he has never been busier either. It's just, um, you know, people I think are appreciating good things, good cheeses and wines and um, the, the better things in life in general for whatever anybody can afford. I think people are just really wanting to seize the seize the moment. And I'm glad that, that cheese gets to be part of that and wine too, because um, I just am, because that's, that's my life too. So um, thank you, Janet, for being the most amazing colleague and partner in this uh, journey. And um, who knows, Cheese O'Clock may be back, we don't know. Uh, but for now, American Cheese Month is concluding. And so this series is as well. And just for today, Emily, thank you so much. You've, you've blessed us with your presence before and you're terrific and wonderful and knowledgeable and have such a wonderful way of talking about wine. I think people are very intimidated by wine so much of the time, but you um, just, take it right down to what it should be, which is something that we should all just learn, you know, just enjoy. And Jeremy, um, you know, I've watched you for a long time, as I said at the beginning, and you are an amazing cheesemaker. You and your family, amazing people, the whole Sweetgrass Dairy family, Liza out here uh, in California, she's amazing too. And so anyway, we're really, really very blessed to have you too. So thank you all for coming you and the, the panelists, but also um, all of you out there. Thank you so much for being part of this. We really appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. So keep buying American cheese. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.